All right, to a very serious story now. And a story we covered earlier, well, well we covered what Monday I got into this. And I again uh, tip my hat to uh, investigative journalist, for, I think for the Herald NZME, um, Matt Nippet, who's stayed on this story. The Waipareira Trust is essentially a trust that has charitable status in New Zealand to do, well, good works for Māori, particularly in West Auckland and for urban Māori. It has for many years been run by one John Tamahiri, a former broadcaster, lawyer and political activist and former cabinet minister, I think, under Helen Clark. Mr Tamahiri is the Il Supremo, Il Duce of uh, the Waipareira Trust, which he, which he runs from an office block in West Auckland. And I've been up to the offices, they're very nice. They've got the mahogany board table and the receptionists and the short skirts and all the rest of the stuff going on. But it has been revealed <coughs> that... Oh, Mr Tamahiri, by the way, is also the president, the chair of Te Pate Māori, the Māori Party. In fact, his son-in-law is one of the co-leaders of the Māori Party. One of its two, well, maybe there are three MPs now with Mecca Faitiri having defected to Labour and not being thrown out of Parliament as she should have been. But it has been revealed that hundreds of thousands of dollars from the charity that was the Waipareira Trust and run by John Tamahiri has been given or loaned, though we haven't seen the documents, to John Tamahiri, head of... Um, the Māori Party, um, hundreds of thousands of dollars um, has been loaned to him for the purpose, it would seem, or certainly has been applied to political activity for the Māori Party. Charities, of course, are not allowed to take part in political activities. And the New Zealand Charities Commission had received complaints about this and investigated. And it would appear, indeed, they found that this had happened. But did they do anything? Did they deregister the Waipareira Trust for so flagrantly breaking the rules? No. They said, please don't do that anymore. And Mr Tamahiri, could you give yourself the money back that you gave so you could spend it on your political party? And that is that for the moment. Nothing from John Tamahiri. Nothing from authorities in New Zealand. And it is an absolute rort and a scandal. And I would question whether it's legal in any way to, as a chief executive, to loan yourself money from your company, even if it is a charity. So many questions still to be uh, answered, in my view, but am I just talking through a hole in my head? Is there anything legal going on here? Well, to find out, I thought we would talk to an expert, um, and our next guest is just that. She's a charities law specialist. Her name is Sue Barker. And she joins us on the line now. Sue, welcome to the platform. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you, Sean. Good morning. All right. Is this as dodgy as I think it is, as a layperson looking at it from the outside? Well, uh, my view is that the law is very clear that charities, they may be political, they should be political, but they may not be partisan. That is, they may not promote or oppose a particular political party or candidate for public office. So it is a breach of charities law, um, and I'd like to say that the reason we know about it, and I, I, and I also would like to uh, tip my hat to Matt Nippert for, for investigating this, but the reason we know about it is because um, registered charities are required to file financial statements on the charities register, and, and all of this is fully disclosed there. And my understanding is that um, <clears throat> uh, from, the, from the media reports, John Tamahiri was... Um, wanting to be completely open about the funding flows um, for getting um, you know, Māori views into Parliament. Um, but the problem is, is that this, what I call the partisan prohibition, the, the, the rule that charities can't be partisan, is not in the statute. And in that respect, we're different to most other comparable jurisdictions, which actually say, say in their charities legislation, you can't do this. So there is a bit of a... Um, there is the possibility that it was a reasonably um, uh, innocent mistake. You know, how can you know what the law is if it's buried in, in case law? And I'm not sure if you're aware, but I, um, with the support of the New Zealand Law Foundation, I've been researching what a world-leading framework of charities law might look oh, like. Okay. Um, 
for two years um, under the New Zealand Law Foundation International Research Fellowship. Um, so I researched comparable jurisdictions and interviewed several hundred people. And one of the recommendations I made was that we should make it clear in our law that charities um, may not be partisan. And then that would remove the, the uncertainty. And, and, you know, it is possible that that, that, um, that aspect of the law... How on earth then, going. Sue, uh, just, just back up the bus here a moment, how on earth <laughs> did Family First get deregistered for taking a stand on the smacking legislation? Well, I think that's the real scandal here. I think, I think the way the current Charities Act is being administered is... Um, uh, is definitely definitely needs to be looked at because what's happened here is that um, the, the Waipareta Trust has actually done something wrong in terms of charities law, but not being deregistered. And and let's be upfront about that. I think that's a good outcome. You don't want to be deregistering charities um, if they if they agree to to fix the problem going forward then okay, stay on the register because there your information is all fully uh, yeah. open to the public and everyone can see what you're doing. Yeah, and you're but pulling the, the tax is, break too, aren't you? Well, that's true. Um, but the problem is, is that Family First, as a matter of charities law, in my view, did absolutely nothing wrong. And yet they received the ultimate sanction of being deregistered. Um, pr precisely because, or only because, the decision makers ha happen to disagree with their views. So... Uh, what, what that concerns me is that if we have a business unit of a government department unelected and largely unaccountable making decisions as to the nature and scope of our civil society based on their subjective views, we don't really live in a democracy. <laughs> um, and this is exactly how it works in China and Russia. They, um, they purposefully exploit charities for community service delivery while using the charities law framework as a tool for restricting um, not-for-profit advocacy. Well, I'm and sorry, that, Sue, it looks like, you know, if they were biased against Family First, I look at Matt's reporting and what has happened here and the responses we've got from the Charities Commission, and it seems they are favourable... Uh, for reasons towards Waipareira. And, and I'm sorry, a layperson cannot look at this. A chief executive lending money to himself personally to apply to another organisation that he's also the head of, that stinks to high heaven, Sue. Well, there's a Charities Amendment Bill currently before Parliament. It was Labour Party policy for the 2017 election to look at this issue, to give the Charities Act a proper first principles review. Uh, to review the definition of charitable purpose and to ensure that charities can engage in advocacy without losing their registered charitable status. Now, this bill that is before Parliament, which has been on, um, on foot since 2018, and I'd just like to say by way of disclosure that I'm a member of the core reference group for the Government's right. Review of the Charities Act, is a breach of that manifesto promise. Uh, it's, it's only looked at five issues, most of which are not of concern to the charitable sector at all. And it doesn't even live up to its stated objective of making practical changes to support charities to continue their vital con contribution to community well-being. What we have here is a bill, re um, a review of the Department of Internal Affairs, um, a, a review undertaken by the Department of Internal Affairs of itself. And, and the bill reflects that. And it's, although it's couched in all this... Um, glowing rhetoric. The reality, as Simon Watts said uh, on the second reading of the bill last week, um, the, uh, the narrative that we're hearing from the, uh, in regards to this bill could not be further from reality. This bill will do nothing to fix this issue. It will do nothing to address issues of concern for the charitable sector, but, but it's being billed to the charitable sector. It's, it's going to be this wonderful thing that's going to do all these wonderful things for you, but it, but it will not. Yeah. Sue, so you said earlier that Waipareira have broken the law or broken the rules. In what respect? Well, the, the law is very clear that charities may not be partisan. They may not promote or oppose a, a particular political party or candidate for public office. And that rule is very important because the key to what makes charities distinctive and valuable is their independence from government. So there is actually a bright line there, which, which is quite a rare thing in charities law. There aren't a lot of bright lines, but that is actually one. And all comparable jurisdictions recognise that, and most have put it in their legislation. So it, it, it's, um, it's unacceptable to do that. And I, it is good to see that, that charity services have... Um, acted on that and sort of well, well, how on. what have they actually done sue because it wouldn't it would appear they have applied no legal sanction 
They have well, said to John, Tammy, Harry, pay yourself back the money you lent yourself. We'll come back and check a little later. It isn't like it's a compliance <laughs> order. It isn't like it's been through a court process or a judicial process. It seems yeah. to be rather disinterested. Uh, well, I'd like to say that I'm not privy to the investigation, so I don't know the full details of everything that has happened. But according to the media reports that I've read, um, they have reached an undertaking from to Aparere Trust that they will no longer fund political candidates or the Māori Party. Um, and uh, John Tanahere is being asked to repay those loans. So that actually does address being the issue. Being asked in my... to, come on. That's like <laughs> yeah, well, asking have... me to pay a parking fine. Well, I mean, that's a very good point because they do say at the end of the media reports that I've read that they're going to be keeping in touch <laughs> to see that that does actually happen. So the, the story isn't over yet, um, and it's been going on since 2019 already, so uh, that's four years already of this investigation, yeah. but it's not over yet. But, but it is interesting uh, in this context, if we're looking at a contest between liberal democracy and the forces of authoritarianism, and if... Um, a kind of manifestation of that is do we treat charities as purely underfunded service delivery arms of government or do we accept that they have a role in broader civil society um, advocating for their charitable purposes? Uh, it was interesting to read that Tuaipurera Trust has really quite um, a high level of government contracts um, for services to, to Māori. I'm not sure, I don't know what the contracts cover, but I understand they're for services to Māori. In and the health, social Auckland. welfare, all sorts of things, yeah. Housing. Yeah, yeah. So deregistering um, to Aparata Trust would not only be um, a significant issue for the Trust itself in terms of um, removing its tax exemption and forcing it to pay a t deregistration tax, which who knows how much that might be, um, but it would also be very complicated for all the government departments that have... Um, yeah. well, see, I, I don't give a toss how complicated it is for the government department. The fact is, the way it's been run, the taxpayer has been paying for the Māori Party. Well, that, I mean, that is... I think actually we're talking about the same thing. It is my concern that the, the way that the Charities Act is being administered is very subjective. And if you happen to be aligning with government values you do seem to get a much easier ride than a charity, for example, like Family First, yeah. who um, the members of the LGBTIQI plus community are hailing the decision in Family First as a win for their community. But I would like to say to them that it's not. Because if you can deregister a charity because a decision maker doesn't agree with your views, all you need is another decision maker who doesn't agree with the views of the LGBTIQI yep. plus community, and then mm. you've got they're coming after you. I mean, it's, free speech has to be for everyone, or it's ultimately for no one. And if we we have an unelected and an unaccountable bureaucracy making decisions about the nature and scope of our civil society, we don't really live in a democracy. And and I I do think um, we. We need to be very concerned about what is happening with the administration of our charities legislation. Wow, I, I'm I'm so sorry I haven't had you on the show uh, sooner. To be <laughs> honest, uh, Sue, because you talk our, our sort of language. I would also note they dropped Matt Nippet's story NZME on Budget Day, where it was guaranteed to get lost in the noise. And I have seen bugger all mainstream media coverage of this story since. Well, that is another concern that I have observed that throughout this process of the charities review. So we have we have this clash of paradigms, right? One one paradigm sees charities as purely service delivery arms of the state, just doing government's mm. work and just they should just get on with it and be quiet. Whereas the other paradigm sees uh, charities' ability to advocate for their charitable purposes as key to what makes them distinctive and valuable. I mean, the, the abolition of slavery, um, universal suffrage, so many important societal changes that have occurred over the centuries have uh, occurred through the advocacy work of charities. Uh, and that their independence from government is critical to that. But we are undermining the independence of charities um, mm. uh, by the way we are administering the legislation. Yeah. yeah. I also have been doing some research, and I want to do, keep on doing work on this, on the way that charitable status is used, in some cases to obscure the funding of certain organisations. And I look at the Helen Clark Foundation, funded by a thing called the Rata Trust out of Christchurch. 
The Helen Clark Foundation receives uh, support from AUT and a number of government agencies. It's got quite a million dollars, millions and millions of dollars in its operating budget. Um, and then I get back and I've got a probe through the trust that has charitable status that provides it, and it used to be called the Southern Trust. But there are all sorts of organisations. I look at the, at, at the uh, Mental Health Foundation, which ran uh, a completely partisan and weird anti-bullying campaign last Friday, which seemed to be more a transgender rights campaign using Chenille Lal as a poster boy. And essentially all these organisations, uh, and actually uh, let me just split Helen Clark off there, the Mental Health Foundation, the bulk of its money comes from the government. It is basically an arm of the government, but because it's a charity, it can tell you to bugger off. It's not, um, it's not subject to the Official Information Act. And it can pursue a political uh, agenda on issues like transgenderism. Completely free from any of the constraints or accountabilities that would apply if the government of the day was spending that money directly. Yeah, but, but what, I mean, I think the problem is actually deeper than that because my experience of, throughout this review of the Charities Act is that it was the Department of Internal Affairs that had an agenda. They, they have almost completely con, complete control over which charities get to get on the register and which charities get to stay on the register. And this review that should have been a first principles review should have been an opportunity to look at the way the Charities Act has been, is being administered. Mm. But, but the DIA absolutely blocked those issues from being discussed or looked at. They um, uh, really put barriers in the way of efforts to speak truth to power. Um, and, and I do think that Simon Watts sums it up, that we're, we're being sold this narrative that everything's fine here um, with the way the Act is being administered. But, and, and we're going to get this bill through that's going to entrench current difficulties and it's but BS. everything is not fine it really needs to be looked at and i'm grateful to you for raising these issues because they need to be discussed because the charities amendment that bill is going through it affects every registered charity in the country and every person they work for which effectively is all of us um and there's nothing in the mainstream yeah. media about this charities amendment bill yeah. so Again, is, they, there they any, is there any recognition from opposition parties who might become government one day um, despite the best efforts of the mainstream media. Um, is there any indication National Act or any other party shares your concerns and is prepared to do anything about it? Well, I'd like to do a shout out to the opposition parties because if you if you read the, uh, the speeches on the second reading of the bill, which actually uh, happened the, di the night before budget day as well, <laughs> mm. um, they are speaking truth to power. They are actually giving voice to the concerns of charities that I hear um, up and down the country. Um, people are certainly complaining to me, and um, but. The, the powers that be are refusing to listen to, to listen, and it really does bother me um, that the minister appears to consider it her role to implement the policy set by DIA rather than the policy set uh, on which she's been elected. Mm. And it does also bother me that the, the select committee that considered the Charities Amendment Bill, which of which Labor had a majority, seemed to have considered it their role to merely rubber stamp the bill. They've made a few tweaks, but they haven't actually really considered uh, whether some of these provisions should even be in the bill at all. Uh, and they also appear to have accepted DIA's advice without critical consideration. So here we have DIA policy being set for our civil society, which is really a fundamental pillar of our democracy. It's being set by an unelected and largely unaccountable bureaucracy, which is a black box, yeah. you know. Who knows why they're making these decisions on all these individual charities? Uh, it's it's all behind closed yeah. doors. And uh, it seems it will remain so. So we have basically the Waipareira Trust getting slapped over the back of the hand with a wet bus ticket if they want to, if they choose to put their hands out, but they don't really have to. The other point I want to end on is Greenpeace is still a charity in New Zealand. Yeah. Which I, yeah. I just think when we look in the context of Greenpeace and how it operates is just remarkable. Well, I think the contrast between Greenpeace and Family First is very interesting. There is not really any distinction between the two. So if Greenpeace is a charity, why is Family First not? And, and it does bother me that both of these charities, and I do consider Family First to be a charity, have been through over a decade of litigation. Of litigation, yeah. Well, trying it, to... Yeah. yeah. 
the, the whole process is, is, is utterly flawed and the, the amendments that are being made by the charity or proposed to be made by the charities amendment bill regarding the appeals process, in my view, will not fix the issue and they will make it worse. Mm. So, I mean, it, it, it's, it seems as though, um, you know, charities, the government seems to have it in for charities, basically. Well, into charities they don't like and they're all for yes. charities they do like. Yes, and that's the problem because once we have once we have charities, once we blur that boundary between charities and government, we lose what makes charities distinctive and valuable. Uh, so yeah. I have to ask, in the interest of balance and fairness, and because I'm a journalist, do you are you a member of a political party or a charity? Do you have an axe to grind in relation to these matters? I'm not a member of any political party. I am a director of the Charity Law Association of Australia and New Zealand, which is an Australian registered charity, but I'm a, a legal practitioner. I've been practicing in this particular area of charities law since last century. And what is motivating me to uh, speak out about these issues is I see firsthand at the coalface the damage that is being done. If you look at the, the vibrancy and the passion with which charities fought for their independence when the Charities Bill was originally going through in 2000, with the muted and almost apologetic way so many charities um, made submissions on this bill, and not all of them, and, and well done to those that, that weren't. Mm. But um, we, it, that really, to my mind, absolutely demonstrates how we are damaging our charitable sector and our civil society and our democracy and our social cohesion by the way we are letting this bill, be, this, this legislation be administered. And it's, it's, a, it's a travesty that this um, review of the Charities Act that's been done will not address any of those issues. So that has been a most fascinating and edifying conversation. I thank you very much indeed for taking the time to talk to us all this morning and we hope, I hope we talk again in the future. Pleasure. Thanks so much. Cheers. That is Sue Barker, Charities Law Specialist, a lawyer. Wasn't that fascinating? So basically, yep, Waipareira broke the rules, but nothing's really going to happen, and John Tamahiri. Um, and that she believes the Department of Internal Affairs, and, and by extension the Charities Commission, are not impartial, are playing favourites when it comes to how charities are treated, and there is political interference or political bias in our bureaucracy. What a damning indictment of this country. What a damning indictment of this country is that, is that issue. And she says, family first, agree with them or not, they shouldn't have been deregistered. If they were deregistered, surely Greenpeace should be as well. And maybe the Waipareira Trust. But the whole thing, I think a new government has to look very carefully at charities and trusts and how they are used to funnel government money in a political sense towards friends of the government of the day. And Labor are good at this. I'm just going to say this. Labor and the Greens are good at this. They're cunning little buggers. The Nats, don't worry. There's a, there's a lazy arrogance about a national party or a right-wing party in power. They think they're born to rule, so they don't go around conniving to make sure they always will. Oh, but Labor, it's all about the committee and the subcommittee and who ups, who's up who and who's paying.